So thank you to Gavin, our Clinical Simulation Fellow for this year and also he does work um, part time in A&E as one of our amazing ED doctors this year. Um, thanks to him for giving us just a little background on when and why we might use um, NIV or CPAP. So what I want to do with Penny in this wee bit is just to have a chat more with you around the practical side of just setting up NIV and understanding monitoring its use as well. Um, I've done this little um, chart that hangs on the side of our BiPAP machines, hopefully a bit helpful just to sort of point you through if you've forgotten some of the sort of critical things that you want to be thinking about, preparing, gathering together. So the first thing I say on there is check your patient has had a chest x-ray which should always be done before um, NIV or CPAP is uh, commenced and that's just to, one of the reasons is to exclude pneumothorax. We also should have a TEP in place and um, Gavin mentioned it is a form of ventilation um, and before you start either CPAP or BiPAP we need to know where else we might go in terms of care if this doesn't work um, and they need to have a discussion around is this the best thing to do as Gavin said. So the things you need to gather together, you need to have one of these Trilogy NIV machines and you need to have an NIV tubing and, uh, and a suitable mask and the things that you would require for NIV are all in the breathing column in the, uh, in the main store, as you know it's all set out now ABC, so in the first breathing column in the bottom three drawers you've got all your NIV tubing and the different sizes of masks as well. So when we open this out, um, these masks now come, we used to have to find a second filter in COVID, now these masks actually come with the second filter uh, already on them, which is really handy. Sorry, let me rather rip it open. So as before, the, the straight filter or whatever, the, just the filter on the end of it, quite straightforward looking there, will connect to the side of the machine. So that just goes through in there and plugs in. All right. Then you've got this skinny bit of cable that is used for monitoring in ITU but we don't have anything um, there that we fit it on to so it's no use to us and actually leaving it on, leaving this end swinging in the wind causes an air leak so we are advised to remove that skinny end of the cable off there and there's a little cap on there, I'm not sure if you can see that Kevin, there's a little cap that goes over there to prevent any leaks. All right. The second filter that we used to have to hunt around to find the yellow one that we had to put on is now already attached and it's attached in the correct place. In, at the beginning of COVID, from a hospital perspective, we were all told to put the ex extra filter between the, the hose and the mask that way, but now we're told the correct placement of it is on the expiratory port where the patient's air or breath comes back out through and that makes more sense to all of us, I think, that that actually goes on the expiratory port but as I say, that now comes as standard in the bags and the packs that we get. So you don't have to go looking for that second filter. It is already there. Just leave it there. All right. So the next thing you need to do is um, find a correct uh, size of mask. On each of your iPad machines, you should have all three sizes. And you'll have small, medium and large. You can see the sizes on there. You'll um, I'm going to just ask Penny to help me with this bit because we're going to try and fit a mask to um, for Susanne over here and we'll show you how we do that. Before you actually fit the mask, it's really important to have your patient sat up nice and straight on the trolley. Straight as they can tolerate, that's better for their ventilation, for their breathing. And then if you just grab your mask, and what's the best way to open it? Bottoms probably slightly easier. Grab your mask and if there's a plastic cover in this spongy bit, just as you're taking it all off, take that plastic bit off too. At the moment, we're coming without a plastic shield on there, so that's absolutely fine. It's always a two person job, best we can, to fit the mask, okay? It's really important to do that where we can. And again, the principle of fitting the mask is keep the mask, keep your patient as vertical as possible, but also keep the the mask vertical to the patient um, when you're fitting it. But before we even do that, we need to make absolutely certain that we have got the correct mask. I have used uh, this on a before, so I sort of know what size I'm going for. But in the patient's 
when you've got a patient and you want to uh, figure out what size of mask is appropriate, we use these little cutouts here on the bag that the masks come in. Pick out the one that you feel is most likely to work. And you would do this before you would actually even open the bag. All right, just make sure you've got the right size before that you would um, open the bag and waste some. And where you're aiming for is the bottom of the mask wants to sit in the cleft of the chin just there and the top of the mask just at the bridge of the nose, not including the eyes and not including the mouth at the bottom either. So we're going to Penny beautifully demonstrating there. So best we can with Rastusian, this little bottom bit is in the cleft of her chin and she is just about still at the top of her nose there. It's probably still going to be slightly large but assuming a, even a small human is going to be slightly larger than her little Rastusian potentially. Okay, so otherwise that fits her beautifully, and we're happy that the size small mask is the correct size. Okay. So as I've said already, keeping your mask vertical when you go to fit it, we will also just loosen the straps all the way around. So we'll almost make it as large as you can before you go to fit it. So loosen all the little Velcro bits there at the top and at the sides. Keep the top bit. It's already fitted to the mask. It's not swinging loose like the straps at the bottom. Keep those as they are, okay? You don't want to disconnect anything more than you need to make it more complicated for yourself. And keep it um, vertical best you can and just use this sort of like little head cage or whatever. Drop that back around the back of the patient's head and then you've got these little um, knobbly bits that fit in, clip into the little holes at the side so just duck those in there, they'll clip in nicely and then from there the reason you need two people is so that the two people can pull on the straps at the same time to keep your, to keep your fit even so you're not sort of pulling around a lot on one side and not very much on the other so we'll go together Penny and just, sorry, I'm going to pause because it's got, obviously our patients wouldn't have pieced together necks. I hope they don't. You've dropped it. Oh, we've dropped it down. No worries. We're happy. Yeah, and we're roughly the same around on the, the edges there. And before we fit the top one, so the, the purpose of this little foam bit is, I'm keeping your patient vent vertical is ideally this little foam bit will fit to the patient's forehead. But what you don't want to do is force the mask back so these foam bits fit to the forehead. There's a little sliding post here, and best you can, you can just push on the sides of it there, and that little post will actually move with you and go back towards the patient's forehead. So now the little foam bit, when we pull on the straps, will rest against the patient, and we haven't tilted the mask back and forced it against the patient's face, which is really important. Okay, so again, same principle applies, bear with me, Let's just grab that there, lovely. So together we will pull, together, lovely, so we're largely the same, we're keeping it nice and straight on the patient's face, and we've gone roughly, yeah, the same on each side there, okay? We can see already, we fitted, mouth is clear, nose is clear, that's actually quite a nice fit, it's just meeting at the cleft of the chin there and on the bridge of the nose. We want it to be firm but not tight. We can cause pressure ulcers on our patients if we pull it really tight and that's something we don't, we don't want to do. Um, just a nice firm fit on there. Okay. At this point you would take it off again. The patient will have been on uh, oxygen while you're getting this, before you get this set up. Once you have your fit of the mask, you take it off, but you don't touch your Velcro straps again because now you've got your mask fitted, you know exactly what's going to fit. We then use these little clips at the side to pop it off while we get the rest of it set up. Okay, so we've got the mask fitted and we're happy that that's going to fit when everything else is ready. Okay, you put your patient back on whatever oxygen they were on best you can while you're getting the rest of it together. Okay. So, and then this would fit to the, the mask before obviously it's going to be connected to the patient. All right. The next thing you're going to have a think around then is connecting this to the wall, okay? And there's two things that are really important. Obviously, power is one and oxygen is the other. And one thing I find that has caught a couple of nurses out is actually because we keep our ventilators plugged to the wall all the time, 
it's quite easy to walk into the room and think you're, you know, your BiPAPs or your glance round and there's something plugged to the oxygen. Um, you're happy or you think that this is um, already plugged to oxygen and it's not. So just be doubly certain that uh, you're plugged to oxygen as well as power. Power is pretty straightforward. And as most of you probably know, to disconnect your ventilator and reconnect uh, the BiPAP machine, it's a case of pushing against the circular piece at the back of the oxygen port. You'll get a bit noisy for a few seconds. Remove that one, and then there's a little dip in the top of the, the little connector thing, whatever it is, that connects to the top of the port that you're going into. And it takes a really firm push just to make that stay. So give it quite a firm push in, make sure it's clicked, make sure it's well firmly plugged in. Okay, so that's your oxygen and your power. And I have noted all these things um, down here best I can. Um, the other thing to have ready before you go, before you're even starting, is make sure the doctor, be it Gavin or whoever is looking after the patient, has helped you complete one of these. They don't, we don't necessarily say, the doctor, am I correct in saying this, Penny? They don't necessarily have to sign it, but it should be in the notes and signed as to where they want the patient to start off in terms of, as you heard Gavin explain, the inspiratory and the expiratory pressures will be you know, settled and, and prescribed at the beginning. It will be different for each patient. As nurses, we don't um, choose what those pressures are. The doctors will have decided that. Um, but they should be listed on this little monitoring chart before you begin. So what else information you will have on there? Obviously, patient's details, date and time, and then the, the oxygen that they're on before you start. So it could be 15 litres, 10 litres, 4 litres, whatever it is. That's keeping them titrated best you can between their 88 and 92 usually and then um, the, the SATs that you're currently getting. So quite often when they're going on to this, even there might be unreasonable oxygen, 8 litres or something, their SATs might still be pretty rubbish. So you put on wherever they're starting, and this is just to give us a baseline. Then some of the results from the gas, as um, Gavin mentioned, the pH and the PCO2, uh, bicarb, all those details you put in there. And then the settings we're starting at. So whatever the doctor has prescribed, inspiratory and expiratory, and also the oxygen um, that you're going to be giving through this uh, the FMIO2 um, level that the doctor has decided with you that they're going to start at really and then when the next gas is due and that's really important I've been told recently we're good at setting this up now but we're not very good at continually monitoring our patient afterwards so it does give quite clear guidance down there that an hour after um, all of this has been started we need to actually be repeating or the doctor needs to come back repeat the ABG again and um, review the patient and obviously you're constantly monitoring them and if anything is deteriorating in the meantime you'd also be getting the doctor back more quickly than that or if you felt like your patient wasn't improving you'd also speak to the doctor so we'll be doing a little bit more teaching I think fairly soon around monitoring patients on BiPAP and NIV but there is a little bit of a basic guide on there and some more information on the back of your monitoring chart and just to say before I set this to the side each time doctor comes back and reviews the settings that you want, the new settings should be placed on here, the new gas story and all of that. And if you just change the oxygen um, titration in between as well, you can just uh, make little, uh, a new date and time on there and just put in whatever changes have been made to the BiPAP and that's really important to keep recording that on there. So now I have a bit of a chat around um, actually setting the settings as such on the on the BiPAP machine. So if we um, just put it on, it is a bit noisy, the machine, when it's not connected to a patient. In the bits of study and I have done, I'm just going to show you a little bit of a hack just for the purpose of, well, Penny can keep the noise down when we do it that way, maybe. Or there's a little bit of a hack that I've put a note on there. If you press the alarm button and the downward button, you can actually set all the settings silently and then once they're saved and you press finish and exit, uh, it will save it when you turn it on and when you go back in, the settings you've put in there will stay, which is quite comforting. Um, but we'll, we'll do it the way that is normally done because a lot of people don't remember to do that. So if you're happy to keep the sound down, Penny, we'll do it that way. And again, when you want to change things when it's on the patient, it will just be running anyway. So we'll put the power on. All right, and just to say as well, when you come to the settings as such, I have put a little bit, it will change maybe slightly soon, but I have put down 
two little um, sections there, settings for BiPAP and settings for uh, CPAP on the back. So depending on what, you're, what the situation is with the patient, what it is you're hoping to achieve, these are the settings you would expect to, to start off with, okay? And then when you've got it turned on, to access the menu, the menu button is here, okay? So it's the up and down, and you want to, in this case, you want to get to settings and alarms, and that's the same as if you go in silent there, you go in like this. So you're using these little navigation arrows to uh, navigate your menu as such, so down to settings and alarms, okay? And I'm gonna ask Gavin to shout out, what pressures would you like us to start on this time, Gavin? What have you chosen for your page? Uh, let's say 10 and 4. Let's start with 10 and 4. All right. So knowing that, you've got that recorded on the, the little NIV chart. That's perfect. And what oxygen concentration shall we start with? Sorry to put you on the spot. 21. Let's go 21. Yeah. Lovely. Grand. So we're doing BiPAP. We're on 10 and 4. Inspiratory pressure of 10. Expiratory pressure of 4. And 21 percentage in FiO2. Okay. So when you follow the, um, the little pointers here for settings for BiPAP, when you select, go into settings and alarms, can you see that Gavin? I'm not sure if that's clear. But press select because you want to go into these settings now. And when you follow this, dual prescription should be off, okay? And it is off. So you don't need to do anything on there, we're happy. Following down to mode. Now the mad thing is about the mode on the BiPAP machine doesn't say BiPAP anywhere, okay? So BiPAP is ST when you go into this system, all right, which means spontaneous timed, and that's just how BiPAP is, is described in here. CPAP is CPAP, oddly, BiPAP is ST, but I've written in there, so the mode you want for BiPAP, because that's what you're setting up, is ST, which is fine. That is the mode that's already set. Let's pretend it's not that, and I'm just going to show you a quick whiz around this little menu. So I did want to change that for any reason. If I press modify, it will take me into that mode menu as such. I can then navigate it using that. And two clicks down, I've got CPAP, should I want that? Keep going on back to I find ST again, because that is what we're setting up. And that's the ST just there. Okay, so I'm now happy with that. And I'm going to say, okay. Okay, which will take you back to the side of the, the settings and alarms menu. Okay, the next thing that it says is AVAPS. On my little guide it says that should be off, which is fine. Let's just leave that off. That's grand, we don't need to do anything there. Keep navigating down. The IPAP is now this inspiratory pressure. Gavin has prescribed uh, that it should be 10 centimeters of H2O. So it's currently set at 24, so we're gonna change that to 10, all right? So to do that again, if you want to change anything, you need to click on the modify button and scooch down your little menu there to get from 24 to 10. So now it's at 10, we're happy. We just say, okay, all right. The EPAP is already set at four, so that's nice and handy. We don't need to change that. Gavin's happy with that, we're going to leave that be. On down to breath rate, and on the little guide, breath rate waves suggested is always 1.5. No, sorry about that, it's 15, to make more sense. So it's currently set at 12. We can change that up a couple to 15 and say, okay. Okay, the inspiratory time should ordinarily be 1.5 on our machines. Some of these machines have come to us from other places quite recently. So what our consultants here have decided is 1.5 they're happy with, okay? So again, we want to modify that one. So we're gonna modify and change it from 1.2 to 1.5. We're happy with that, we're gonna say, okay. All right, FiO2 in this case is 55%. Gavin just wants 21 for now to get them started. And we're going to navigate down through to make that 21. Okay. Following on down, trigger type is auto track, that's perfect, we don't need to do anything with that. Then rise time is two, which is fine. Ramp length is uh, off on there, which is fine as well. And nebulizer enabled is the next thing, says off, and the alarms in our case, 
uh, we keep them all off for now. That may change soon as well. We're, that's under discussion, so just keep an eye. If it does change, we'll have a separate little piece on here that has the alarms, what you want to do with them individually, and you just follow that. I put a little indicator on here as to where to go with them. Something like this we may, we may go to, okay? So everything is following that down. Everything is as it should be, either according to this or the things that we normally do try to titrate and change according to your prescription cheat sheet. So when you're finished, you're finished. Press the finish button, okay, you're happy. Press finish, and now it's asking, do we want to activate ST mode? And you do, because you're going to set this all up and get it going for the patient, all right? So that's what you're trying to do. So say yes, okay? And then when you've said yes, and you're all happy, and it's activated, you just exit, okay? And now what Penny's holding in her hand should be BiPAP running at 10 and four, and with 21% oxygen coming through from the wall. Okay, perfect. So the next thing is to attach it to the patient. And actually, this takes a bit of prep in terms of just trying to, it's not very pleasant, really. And I've been told for the patient, one of the best things to kind of prepare them for it is to say, if they imagine being in a car and putting their head out the window, kind of the bit of force or pressure that comes at your face when you've got your face out the window of a car, is similar to, to how it feels with that sort of positive pressure um, of breath coming towards you. So if you sort of prepare them for that, have it going as it is in Penny's hand and then gently, before you sort of tie them into it and put the straps on, just gently place it against their skin, which Penny will do now, and just start to introduce it to them. Promise, I always say as well, if you can promise them that they will get a drink and get a little break in, in half an hour. Try and not do anything, because usually they're pretty unwell when we're, we're putting this on. So try not to maybe stop it for the first you know, 20 minutes, half an hour, until they're a wee bit more stable. But have a drink beside them, let them have a drink before you put it on, and then promise them a drink that you'll get a break in 20 minutes or half an hour. We will you know, disconnect it and give you a little rest, just briefly, uh, from it. But try and encourage them to tolerate it the best they can. And when they're sort of not fighting you off and tolerating it fairly well and understanding what you're trying to do with them, then you can reconnect. You've already fitted your mask, so this bit should be nice and smooth and simple. And um, you already know this is going to fit. Okay. So it's just a case then of hooking in the little balls into the little sockets as such on the side. If you feel like it needs a little bit more adjusting or it starts to alarm and you've got a bit of an air leak it may be that you need to just tighten it up slightly okay Penny's doing that beautifully there lovely perfect and we're not alarming and it's all good okay so do try and stay with your patient when you've got BiPAP going as I say it's quite it's quite a dramatic thing if they've never had it before stay with them best you can reassure them Currently, it's not been treated as an AGP in the hospital. Um, I think that could change again in winter, we're really not sure, but at the minute we're being told that we can transfer patients even with BiPAP going. Um, what we would say, whether or not that you're allowed to transfer them with it, it is really, really important. If you're taking a patient that's either on BiPAP here and going without it to the ward or going even with it on, uh, in situ while you're doing it, is give the ward good warning that you're coming so they can get their machine ready with your settings or patient settings on already. So when you get the patient there, um, everything's ready to go and there's no delay with sort of keeping their treatment going, um, especially if you've had to transfer without the BiPAP um, because of COVID or whatever reason. Okay, I think that's it. Is there anything else you think, Penny, while we're still going? That's uh, The nebulizer thing, I'm thinking, but I think we'll do it separately because I haven't got... I'm that's a, my only question. Oh, brand, because um, I'm bored listening to myself now, so it's, it's time to stop and we'll give you a break and, and we'll do the nebulizer thing as a slight extra. 